depending where you are in the world, good evening, good afternoon, good morning. And hopefully we'll see you in a few hours time if you're still getting up in, in, in Latin America and, and North America. Uh, welcome to the Bristol Poverty Institute's conference on poverty and social justice in a post-COVID world. I am Shailen Nandi, um, a member of staff at Cardiff University, and I will be chairing today's session on poverty and COVID in Asia and Oceania. My co-chair today is Dr. Lauren Winch, uh, manager of the Bristol Poverty Institute. Before I introduce our um, four excellent speakers, a few words of housekeeping. This session today is being recorded and will be posted on the YouTube platform and embedded within the BPI, the Bristol Poverty Institute website for, for, for viewers around the world. By attending, you are kindly consenting to being part of this recording. Please ensure that you have added your name rather than um, an anonymous guest ID um, as um, to your to um, to your Zoom slot, I suppose. Um, and so this will be uh, monitored by the BPI team. And also we need to know who's asking questions and, and, and for our speakers. You will be able to ask questions via Zoom's Q&A function, which can be found at the bottom of your screens. However, due to time, time constraints, we may not be able to answer every question, but please feel free to get in touch with the speakers after the sessions to continue the conversations that I hope will be sparked from the presentations today. Please note that the chat function is not available to attendees, so please use the Q&A function down at the bottom. I think it's the third one in from the right on the bottom of your screens there. As with all events like this, please uh, be respectful of speakers and of, of, of participants. All events at this conference are being monitored and we reserve the right to remove attendees whose comments are deemed offensive or derogatory. And before we get going with the presentations and before I introduce our speakers, we're going to have a few words from our host, um, from the host at the BPI, who will give us a brief introduction to their research institute and this particular conference. So it's over to you, Lauren. Great, thank you very much, Shalen, for that fantastic introduction and for, for chairing our session today and welcome to all of our attendees. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to give a quick introduction to the Bristol Poverty Institute. Um, apologies to those of you who are joining multiple sessions today, you will hear this a, a few times. Um, so we're going to keep it fairly brief, but we've got plenty more information on our website and other channels. So do get in touch if you want to find out more about us. Um, but the Bristol Poverty Institute was launched in 2017. And we're an interdisciplinary research institute at the University of Bristol, whose role is to grow, develop and promote the poverty and poverty relevant research community at the university and beyond, engaging across sectors to work together to end poverty in all its forms everywhere. And we take a really multidisciplinary approach to poverty and we really focus on the poverty relevant um, aspect of our, our remit, because one of our roles, we think, is to make people who don't necessarily work on poverty think about the poverty dimensions and implications of their work to try and, and achieve the greatest impact across the across the world. So all of our work is driven by our mission to explore the interface of different social, political and environmental dimensions of poverty, with the ultimate aim of translating our research on the causes, effects and measurement of poverty into evidence informed policy and practice, which drives forward social justice. So introducing our conference today, uh, we started yesterday. Um, with an in-person day in Bristol in the UK, and today we're doing our online event. So it's a hybrid event across these two days, benefit, balancing the benefits of in-person engagement with the accessibility of online events. Our aim was to bring together a broad multi-sector audience to explore how the pandemic has impacted on different dimensions of poverty. And uh, this pandemic obviously has wreaked havoc across the world, disrupting all of our lives. New inequalities have emerged and existing inequalities were exposed and exacerbated, and many of these have persisted long beyond the peak of the pandemic. Whilst the title of our event talks about a post-COVID world, this is with real recognition that COVID is very much still here, affecting lives and resulting in premature deaths. The focus of this conference is therefore on dimensions of poverty in today's world, and that's a world which has been shaped and impacted by that pandemic in various ways. We need to explore and understand all of the ways the pandemic has impacted on our societies and what needs to be done to mitigate the negative impacts and harness the opportunities. And that's why we're here today. 
So in terms of our plan for today, uh, we've got a diverse programme across four regional sessions, exploring how the pandemic has affected dimensions of poverty and social justice around the world. Um, so we're essentially following, uh, following the sun around the world, shedding light on poverty in different regions. Uh, so we hope you can join us for some or, or all of these sessions um, because of the amount of speakers we've got and the sessions we've got. This is split across two slides, so I'll move to the second half of it now. Um, so, yeah, we're in the first session, obviously, at the moment, which is poverty and COVID-19 and uh, Asia and Oceania. Moving on to Europe next, then Africa after lunchtime in the UK, finishing up with the Americas. So exploring both North and South American dimensions um, at the close of the day. So I uh, hope you can join us for a lot of that. I hope you enjoy the sessions today. And I'm going to hand back over to Shailene, our session chair, to um, take the session forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, can't believe it's it's several years since the COVID pandemic and I still struggle to find the mute button on, on Zoom after all this time. Um, so let's move swiftly on to the first of our presentations today. Um, just a reminder to colleagues that we are we sort of have 20 minutes in total for each presentation. So 15 minutes in, I'll probably cough on the microphone to um, interrupt you to say that's five minutes to go. Um, please forgive me for interrupting your talks, as I'm sure you'll be in full flow by then. Um, and we will we will hold questions to the end. If if participants or if if um, viewers want to include questions, please do use the Q and A uh, function um, to submit questions, which we will put to all part, all presenters at the end of the sessions or at the end of the talks today. Our first speaker today is Professor Maggie Lau. Um, who is from Lingnan University in Hong Kong. She is a research associate professor in the School of Graduate Studies and a research fellow, the Institute and a research fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies at Lingnan University. Her research fields and expertise include development and policy studies, poverty and social exclusion, children's health, and child well-being. And today, Maggie is going to be talking to us about child poverty and well-being in Hong Kong and the effects of the pandemic there. Maggie, please. Okay, thank you, Charlene. Uh, let me show you. So... Okay, um, thank you um, the introduction and also um, the invitations from the organizers. Um, today, I think I will plan to do two things. One is to try to review the um, poverty study in Hong Kong and also highlight the significance of the child deprived and multidimensional approach to child poverty measures. And also um, because recently the government has sort of ready um, the update to the um, official poverty measures, uh, most likely um, they will release the update at by the end of 2024. So um, I think it's timely to share um, the poverty measure in Hong Kong, as well as the um, some uh, poverty uh, alleviation strategies from adopt by the Hong Kong uh, SAR governments. Um, this is um, the overview for today's. Um, I think I will go straight to, because of the time limit, I will go straight to highlight the things that I will talk about for today's uh, presentation. Um, try to highlight the issue uh, which um, the Hong Kong uh, Child Poverty Study has already um, achieved so far um, from various studies that uh, we, we use different approach. Um, first is the poverty study identify three approaches which uh, to a certain extent include uh, the children in poverty definition and measurements, um, including household centric, child centric, and also the child deprived approach. Um, first, um, basically we will uh, all know, basically we will use the income-based poverty to measure, um, to identify the poor household. But um, what we already know that um, the, limitation of the income-based poverty. Um, that's why we um, try to adopt the consensual deprivation approach, which can capture um, the gender and the intra-household inequality. Uh, we try to um, incorporate household and individual level of analysis. Um, of 
and also acknowledge the multidimensional nature of child poverty and directly measure the uh, child living standards. Um, more importantly, uh, because previously we usually based upon the adult or the expert approach to assess the children needs. Um, in the past uh, few uh, ten uh, the ten years, we we tried to explore the child focused approach, which recognized the uh, views from the children. Uh, today, I will try to use some um, child poverty study to demonstrate the the values of um, to incorporate the um, children voice. This is the graphics that are uh, sorry. This is the graphic that's uh, highlights so far um, the poverty research in Hong Kong, which starts from Professor Levin Charles' um, 1982 study, which adopts the relative separation approach um, up to um, the latest one that uh, we, um, the project team uh, got the funding from the Hong Kong government, um, try to um, further the um, consensus approach um, incorporate different dimension um, like uh, the exclusion and deprivation um, approach. And also most important thing is we try to incorporate the children's perspective and um, from the individual level um, of analysis, which is really useful to differentiate uh, the poor and non-poor um, groups. Um, another um, recent study that Hong Kong, um, including uh, myself and um, the colleagues um, who joined the uh, Children World uh, International Survey of Child Wellbeing, tried to incorporate um, the voices of children in um, their middle age, uh, age 8 to 12, tried to identify the determinants of the children's subjective wellbeing. Um, Later on, I will show you um, some key findings from um, this various study, um, specifically uh, for the poverty and social exclusion in Hong Kong, and one uh, uh, study is from SPPL that uh, highlight the importance of the children perspective. Um, first of all is the uh, poverty and social exclusion in Hong Kong, which highlight um, the significant, uh, we try to identify the poor group who lack of the resources, which can, uh, which limit their uh, social participation and um, also uh, exclude them from the ordinary custom and activities. Uh, we adopt this approach to try to uh, uh, apply the consensual approach in the Asian context. As we all know that the consensual approach has been used in various countries across the world. Um, for those who may be um, new to the method, I'm just trying to briefly introduce. Um, um, in principle, when we adopt this approach, first of all, we will get, the, get ready the list of necessity for the adult and also children. Uh, recently, when we try to identify the list of the necessity, we will start from the focus group uh, from various socioeconomic background and try to uh, present the list of necessity and um, uh, try to seek the advice whether there's a, a necessary to modify the list of the items. But when we, um, the next step is to move on to the survey data. Um, from the survey, we will have two uh, stages. The first one is we we will um, try to um, identify the list of uh, whether the, the item will be discussed as a necessity from the uh, general public. Um, there's a yes, no questions, and any item received 50% uh, or more than uh, they will regard as a necessity. The second part is uh, we will ask those uh, respondents whether they have the um, necess uh, the item and the reason why they don't have. If the item those uh, respondents don't uh, have it, uh, is it because the, the um, affordability issue or the availability issues? If this is the 
one of the reasons, then those items will be regarded as uh, deprived items. We will try to um, um, uh, uh, calculate the number of item, deprived items. This approach will, um, I think, is um, incorporate the multi-dimensional nature of poverty and also is have the clear democratic democratic justification for the standards. And it's also uh, um, um, have the age-related standards for adults and children. Um, for PSC Hong Kong, because the list of the item for, uh, I mean, necessity item for children is based upon the adult report. Um, this is one of the limitation from the PSC Hong Kong. But later on, we try to extend this approach to the um, um, children, from the children perspective. Um, but the PSC Hong Kong poverty um, can complement with the um, uh, official, uh, I mean, income-based uh, poverty measures. Because in, uh, usually, if we use the income-based poverty, we could just identify two groups of the uh, people, uh, either poor versus non-poor. But even for the PSC poverty measure, this one is the uh, cross-sectional uh, survey, we still can identify uh, one poor and three poor, uh, sorry, the poor and the three uh, non-poor groups. Um, this diagram shows you the, the classification, which uh, enhance our understanding. Um, when we use PSC Hong Kong poverty measure, we um, can uh, supplement the uh, official income poverty threshold because um, the income-based poverty could not um, identify the PSC poor group because those people who have the multiple deprived and also um, they may not identify the vulnerable groups, which they are um, have the low income but high uh, standard of living because of um, maybe they lost their job. This is really good that we can identify um, those uh, non-poor group, but we need different um, uh, uh, intervention. For instance, for those uh, vulnerable groups, uh, maybe we they need some um, short-term financial support and assistance for the job search. Um, the next uh, is the um, study that will supplement um, the, um, the PSA Hong Kong poverty measure is uh, we try to um, make good use of the um, try to draw from the children perspective to identify the uh, deprivation measures. Um, from this um, study, we can uh, got the evidence that we find some, um, not all the poor children are deprived and some non-poor children are deprived because of, um, for those who are, who, who are non, deprived children in family, I mean, in poor uh, family is because um, maybe there's a possibility that there's a parental sacrifice. Uh, we also, from um, the uh, SPPR study, we also identify the importance of the social relationship, which can help, um, may have some effect on the children's life satisfactions. This is the two slide um, show the evidence uh, I just mentioned is because um, from this table, we can see that um, those who live in the uh, lowest income quartile, um, we find that there's one third of the people who are long deprived. I mean, the children who are long deprived. Um, this is really important that uh, we find maybe the the parents will sacrifice their needs for the um the children uh necessity. The other um uh, evidence to prove is uh apart from the income, we also find other factors which can affect the children overall overall life satisfactions. Um, in terms of age, 
um, number of deprived items, um, the experience of the being bullied, and some um, social relationship with uh, parents, teachers, and the support from the family. This is um, show us that um, the we should adopt the um, multiple of uh, multi-dimensional uh, approach to, to uh, measure the um, child well-being. Um, the other, um, the third um, significant uh, impact, I mean, the evidence to show um, which we should move beyond the uh, income-based measure is we try to identify using the uh, consensual consensual separation approach, um, try to identify whether there's a difference between um, the children and also the adult's perception of, of the child necessity. Uh, from this um, study, we find that uh, both adults and children, they perceive that uh, the minimum list should be moved beyond the basic subsistence. Um, but we also find the generation differences between adults and children. Um, from the slides, we can see from the heat map, we can see that um, in terms of the adult, um, they perceive all the um, necessity item for children um, are, are essential. But the difference between um, the child deprived and the adult deprived necessity um, can be um, spot in some um, we call school extras. That means it's after school um, activities or uh, something related to uh, education. Um, for instance, um, there's some difference between the extra curriculum activities and also the after school um, tutorial class. I think uh, this kind of item is also um, common in other Asian or Chinese societies. Um, but um, the main issues is um, we, to a certain extent, the, the children still realize that uh, all those necessity items are less uh, um, basic, but um, they also want to fulfill um, their, their role, play um, to their social role and also our, uh, obligations, like um, mobile phone and also a computer with the internet. This is, um, really um, important to demonstrate um, there's a generation differences. Um, Five minutes, Maggie. Okay, thank you. Um, the The last um, uh, research is um, talk about uh, subjective well-being, which uh, we would like to explore um, the life satisfaction and subjective well-being from different dimensions. Um, for this study, I think it's good that we can do the comparative, um, not only focus in Hong Kong context, but even in Hong Kong, we still find the age difference uh, for ch children who are um, getting older, they feel uh, less satisfied with their life. Um, you can see from this um, table, uh, we find that um, Hong Kong children was generally lower in the international comparison. And I mean, in terms of the child well-being in different age, age 10 and age 12, um, it's good that we got the um, uh, comparative comparison to show um, the details. The next slide is uh, the, we, we try to compare the uh, 15 aspect. Um, I'm just highlight the um, Hong Kong SAL and South Korea and Taiwan, all those Asian country to demonstrate um, um, one of the, even in general, uh, the Hong Kong kids is happy with their, their life in general, but there's certain aspect uh, we, we do need to pay attention, like time use and um, whether they are listened by uh, the adults. This is pretty important information that we learned from. Um, because of time constraint, I think I, I just give a very brief um, about the update. Um, and also, um, if you refer to this slide, um, this is the latest update about the uh, official poverty line. Um, I'm just picked the child poverty rate. Um, and also want to emphasize um, the, the child poverty rate before 
the intervention and after all select measures. Uh, when we talk about all select measures, we cover three main um, elements. One is recurrence, that means including public assistance, um, non recurrence cash measure, that means is um, some one off uh, payout, and the mean test in kind benefits. Um, we got some latest update from the government that um, they may uh, try to use different formula to calculate the poverty, uh, but we, we don't have any update at the moment. But at the same time, um, the government um, tried to pick based upon the census data to identify three uh, target group which will have the uh, specific poverty alleviation measure, uh, including those who live in uh, subdivided units, single parents household, and also elderly households. Uh, because today is trying to talk about child poverty, I just want to demonstrate, uh, show us, um, show you guys about the um, some selected project at the moment uh, implement. Um, one of them is the uh, school-based after-school care service, and the other is community living room. Uh, for the uh, for the community living room, actually, is try to um, provide those um, SDU subdivided unit family have additional living space and also develop their social network. Uh, because as you have you seen in the picture that I kept captured from the different newspaper um, here. Um, they will have to um, share kitchen that um, those family can prepare their meal and the study room for the kids and also some common room that they can co um, coordinate some event. Um, I think this kind of um, uh, target poverty elevation of project is, is really appreciated, but uh, what exactly the government have to pay attention is um, uh, for my final remarks is um, the relative poverty um, cannot be resolved through the economic growth, but we need more of uh, redistributive policy to address, um, which can, um, even those uh, previously, we got some one-off cash pay payment payout scheme, try to improve the living standard of those poor group, but to a certain extent, it's just uh, short-term uh, solutions. We need we really need the, the uh, uh, well-designed uh, anti-poverty measures to address um, those who are facing multiple deprived uh, uh, situations. I think I should stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maggie. Perfectly timed. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> well done. And again, I apologize to all speakers having to, to, to break in 15 minutes through. Yeah. Each of these talks could be a degree program in themselves on Finnish, or at least the topics on which we're, we're looking at. Um, thank you, Maggie. Um, we, we will hold questions for you until the end, um, if, if, that, if that's okay. And now I would like to, if... Um, Viliami Fifita is with us, I would like to introduce our second speaker for today. Um, Dr. Viliami Konefelenisi Fifita is currently the International Resident Advisor to the Kiribati National, Statistical of National Statistics Office at the World Bank. He holds a PhD from the University of Bristol, a Master's in Applied Statistics from the Australian National University, and a BSc in Pure Mathematics from Waikato University in New Zealand. Um, he's had a distinguished career in public service, beginning in the, uh, the mid-1990s as an assistant teacher in Tonga's Ministry of Education, and has, grad has progressed to senior roles, including um, senior lecturer and assistant government statistician in the statistics department in the Kingdom of Tonga. Today, Viliami will be talking to us about work he's been doing on poverty in the Pacific Island countries, uh, using the consensual approach um, for measurement um, and giving examples from, 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 from the Kingdom of Tonga. Viliami, are you with us? Can we see you? I hope you can hear us. And, and good evening as well, I should say. <laughs> Thank you very much, Poland, uh, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'll try to share my screen. Just to remind you, Viliami, it'll be a fifth. Um, you've got 20 minutes in total, and I'll, I'll butt in at 15 minutes just to say you've got five minutes to go. 
you hear me uh, clearly? I'm I'm talking from one of the North uh, Pacific Island is Kiribati, and it's one of the islands that is very far from the, the Tarawa, which is Christmas Island close to Hawaii. So I will be not talking on a technical paper. I will be talking on uh, maybe a reporter of what what's happening in the Pacific in relation to poverty. Um, uh, is is you 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 hear me? Okay, uh, Shoilin, Before I start, I'm offing my camera because uh, we we can hear you clearly, Billy Ami. Uh, all right, fine. Okay. Uh, uh, I will I, I will give you a, a little bit of a background of uh, of some studies here in the Pacific and and mainly talk about uh, the big wave that. Uh, uh, encourages or uh, trigger the work of poverty here in our region is is the reporting requirements uh, from the SDGs, and then give maybe a few examples of how we have used uh, consensual approach, particularly in Tonga. You might have understood that uh, our small island developing states in 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 the Pacific it's about twenty two uh, countries and territories. And uh, we have sort of like a safety net uh, in our unique setting in terms of our uh, traditional culture of caring and sharing. Um, the images of hunger and destitution of absolute poverty that we often find in some other developing countries is, is more or less like absent from our region. However, there are some issues that recently uh, 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 arises uh, some countries have some political instability. Uh, the changes of government is often uh, more than expected. Uh, there are economic small scale. There are tensions in some of the ethnicities, that some of the youth un unemployment, some social issues. But the main thing is uh, the, the requirement for the reporting from the SDGs. Uh, the era of MDGs, yes, there was poverty reporting requirements for government, but in the in the SDGs, uh, a lot of countries come forward uh, in terms of talking and discussion, and mainly happens in, in another governance layer, which is the Pacific Statistics uh, Community, which is under uh, uh, Pacific Community Secretariat of the Community, which is known as SPC, as the bigger umbrella that serves technical uh, assistance to these uh, islands. Um, so, my brief uh, <clears throat> overview of what happened uh, on, on the MTTs. Yes, uh, Pacific Islands were some of the Pacific Islands were were doing some report, but most were not reporting on poverty. Uh, I knew that the, the 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 global study for child poverty that was done by Professor Corden and Professor Nantin and, and others. Uh, one country from the Pacific, Vanuatu, was joining in 2003, whereby <clears throat> this methodology for the Bristol method that I've uh, been known by was also used in other, other, other work, uh, which includes work that was done by uh, countries in the region, including Tonga, in scoping out the impact of the financial crisis, where uh, one of the tools was this child poverty methodology uh, where um, what's known as Bristol methods. Um, it happens so often that there are bilateral work between some of the countries in our region with other donors or development partners. And they often use uh, some indicators like HDI or Gini coefficients or others uh, to talk about poverty. But I think the first big study was happening in 2004, which the ADB uh, led this study where I think uh, 12 countries were involved, which is known as the participatory assessment of hardship. And if you can see, um, poverty was not a name that was welcomed by Pacific Islands. Instead, they were using hardship. Um, and then the work that uh, I have done mainly with my my research at Bristol, which I was guided by Professor Gordon and Professor Nandi, uh, Sholin Nandi, 
So my title of my thesis was Childhood and Adult Poverty in the Small Island Developing States, which I used Tonga as a case study. This work uh, mainly used consensual approach based on uh, uh, stamping from Bristol method. Uh, consensual approach was seen as more uh, relevant and appropriate to our context, and, and it further uh, to other countries, not Tonga alone, but the other countries like Solomon Island, Fiji, Tuvalu, Kiribati, which was involved with the Bristol Institute of Poverty in, with their assistance. And now I'm going to talk about how the SDGs have have triggered a lot of commitment uh, uh, for, and particularly with the re requirement of the reporting, um, makes it more evident that countries are committed uh, to, to say something or to report on poverty. As you know, from MDGs to SDGs, the demand is higher from eight goals to seven goals, 169 targets, 232. And based on my work as a statistician, I also have some work with the Pacific Statistics Community. And, and most of, of the work that was the discussion around these areas in the reporting requirement, I was heavily involved with the assistance of Bristol Institute in providing advisories to these covenants within the Pacific region. So in particular with a uh, with this goal, like goal number one, uh, one of the main indicators is uh, SDG 1.1.1, which reports on 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 the World Bank uh, extreme poverty, uh, which they known as the twin goal, as you know. And uh, now it's two point fifteen dollar a day per uh, PPP per, per person per day. And then there is a requirement for these countries to report on a national poverty line. So deciding what poverty line or what poverty methodologies uh, to use is also a challenge. And then there is a requirement requirement for the multidimensional poverty, which in Tonga in particular, we have our national poverty line as, as the consensual approach, and that also our multidimensional. Um, this is what the discussion that we have done thoroughly within whenever we had the chance in conferences. Uh, we had the last conference in, in last year in, in Fiji. Um, um, the, the advice was around <clears throat> SDG 1.1.1 is, is a poverty the measure that uh, um, mainly for the purpose of comparability uh, was not um, necessarily to extract the extent and the nature of poverty in our in our region. Um, as you see, as you know, uh, it comes as an approximate average value of the national poverty line of 15 countries, where none of the Pacific Islands nor any Oceania co country were selected in this sample. So they are, the, the, it doesn't reflect our nature. So, but the advice that we have, and most countries were using this indicator just for the reporting, and to showcase that we are we are having a very low, uh, it's a narrow, narrow sighted uh, uh, view of poverty. And as an example, for Tonga, uh, the last measurement in 2001, 2021 was 1%. And as you know, the sampling era is around 5% or more. So this is this doesn't make any sense. So in Kiribati, it was 3% and so forth. So in terms of the second reporting, uh, the national poverty line, this is a struggle uh, for government statisticians to come up with the national poverty line. But as per our role as government statisticians, we have to make informed decisions. And informed decisions have to be evidence that, uh, that we select the, the appropriate and contextual uh, appropriateness of methodologies. As you know, it's a very controversial subject. It means different things to different people. And because we are coming from developing countries, if I may say, we still have the colonial era of of big development partners and, and donors will show us what to do and we should we we, we follow. So the most uh, the most methodology that was been adopted uh, is is the basic needs poverty line, uh, which was um, driving by UNDB and, and the World Bank. 
So, uh, as you know, these slides is 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 part of our discussions and deliberate, so that we can make informed decisions on coming up with a national poverty line. As I've said, in Tonga in particular, our national poverty line, national poverty figure comes from the multidimensional, which is using specifically the consensual approach. So, in fact, we know that there are also a different versions of basic needs poverty line. Uh, and in the Pacific, it's no difference. We have different versions that are used by some countries compared to others, particularly with Fiji. They have a different type and in other countries using a different versions. So you end up having different basic poverty line uh, uh, report methodologies. So for comparability, um, I think it was not necessary. But as you know, one of the problem is 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 the reference population uh, that that no Pacific Island appears to measure the average calorie requirements of their own population, even to date. Um, the, the 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 minimum daily uh, requirements of two thousand one hundred kilocalories is is coming from a different population reference population. So there are critical uh, ideologies that we have been thoroughly discussed with the Pacific Islands, uh, with the with the, with the aiming to make an informed decision on on their choice. Uh, however, the big the key points in our discussion is is that the relationship between the food expenditure and calorie intake um, uh, is not uh, strong enough to, to tease off or uh, to distinguish in between the two groups, the poor and the non-poor. As an example, someone from the Pacific just pull out the cassava from, from, from the neighbor or wherever, then satisfies the calorie requirements without any cost. So having, having to split the two groups, uh, it's important that uh, uh, the 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 indicator should be strong enough, and and this is not happening to us. We also discussed thoroughly the multidimensional. As as you can see, my my thesis was on on a, on a case study on child and adult poverty in a small island developing states, such as all of us who are here in the Pacific. So we I have been advocating for 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 the using of a scientific or using of a of a more appropriate uh, methodology and consensual approach was uh, was our proposal. Uh, of course, there are other candidates for multidimensional, uh, stemming from Crystal Method. There are others that uh, now by UNICEF, uh, the multiple overlapping deprivation analysis, the the MBI, um, uh, which is also UNDB advocates and also MBM recently from the World Bank. Um, however, one of the things that I, I, I really like to show is the, is the, is the four groups that uh, the consensual approach uh, can, can allow us to see. And as we know, poverty line is often arbitrary. And having four groups, and I've seen the previous uh, um, presentation on the four groups, uh, not only just the poor and the non-poor, but we have uh, those people who are rising from poor or vulnerable to poor over time. So in our context where we have, uh, we have seen that the dynamic aspects of poverty is very evident, like the severity of poor is needed to be uh, assist um, in a shorter time time frame. The highest or the household income and expenditure survey comes in every five years, but in between that, because of our context, we are we are diving and escaping from poor more often. Um, it doesn't take too much of 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 an of a, a work programs or any initiative uh, that normally happens in 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 other developing countries to move off our people from 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 a lower uh, 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 lower poverty rates to another uh, I, I give an example and I hope I can make sense here um, somebody just show up to me today and give me one thousand dollars because I can't afford to pay my kids school fees he may be my relative or he may be somebody that knows me doesn't mean that he he has a lot of money 
But then he, he knows that I can't afford to pay my kids' school fees. He just show up and give all what he has. And this is quite a norm. So I, um, having four groups instead of two is more meaningful. So consensual approach is very powerful in, in combinating deprivation and, and monetary in this effect. Five minutes, uh, that, please, William. Five minutes. So, sorry? You have five minutes left. All right. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> yeah, I'll just give two examples from Tonga. Uh, this is this is this is an application of consensual reports, which is different from the reporting requirements. Um, um, be, uh, one of the work that uh, we we did is uh, we used uh, a <clears throat> uh, consensual approach to uh, to do a small area estimation. This was happened during. Uh, a cyclone, as you know, uh, Tonga is is in the ring of fire, which means that a lot of uh, environmental impact can happen anytime. Uh, so we, uh, because of our highest design sampling design was not meant for disaggregation in the lower island divisions. Uh, then the, the COVID, that then the, the cheetah uh, cyclone happens, and and because of the power of of the consensual approach which has a classification error of less than 5%. Uh, with the assistance of Dr. Hector, uh, we managed to come up with a small area estimation that we can identify poverty in a lower desegregation geographical locations. Um, I, want, I don't talk about more about this, but there is this paper has been uh, peer reviewed and, and it's, it's shown here. Another, another work we did is uh, on uh, on a, a school and employment for Tongans, which is a World Bank project of uh, uh, around US 14 million. Uh, one of the, the, the powerful, because we have fine and assess the, the uh, predictable power of consensual approach, it was far more than uh, the five consensual approach deprivation questionnaire questions is, is far more better than even a UBN questionnaire of 10 or more. So we use that to identify people with, with children who are poor and allocate this, uh, this, this for the World Bank. So it's, it's a milestone in my view that the power of uh, consensual approach is, is being used not only for the reporting requirement, but for other initiatives. And this is just two of the examples that I want to show here. Um, I think, um, it's starting to grow in terms of knowledge and stem in terms of understanding that the consensual approach is 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 a more uh, appropriate. Uh, uh, unfortunately, that we we didn't use it this for the impact of the COVID, which is mainly uh, reason for our 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 conference. But I can tell you a little bit of a background. In in January 15 in Tonga 2022, there was a volcanic eruption. After that, then we start with the lockdown in the 2nd of February, 2022. But then we just completed our highest on the third quarter of 2021 with the census completed in December the same year. So you can see the time lack of uh, having a national survey that doesn't scope out the impact of this big shock within a government. So... I, we missed this during this time uh, after the, the volcanic eruption and then continue on to the lockdown and just finishing off highest and, and census. I was in a state that I knew for sure with the power of consensual approach, we can scope out the impact of poverty by these, by these uh, shocks. However, uh, because of the uh, mindset of the people during that time was not appropriate to run a survey. And we were new to doing phone survey using CATI. So we were investigating on using CATI and then June, I move off to Kiribati. In Kiribati, we are doing, we are trying to do a real-time data collection that will be assessing poverty uh, over time more frequently other than, than waiting for the five long, long-term uh, collections. Uh, so I think I should pause here, um, uh, Soylen, and I hope it makes sense. My, my, my talk is if, happy to answer any question if if there is any. Thank you. Thank you very much, Viliami. I've got twenty seconds left on here, which I will 
hit pause on the timer to say thank you for that. Um, I mean, we, 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 we having having been to, to Tonga and to Fiji, we know the the massive um, effort that is required to collect data from hundreds of different islands spread over uh, um, an area that's probably sort of larger than that of Europe. So it's 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 a non trivial amount of work that goes in probably much more so than we see in, in many of the other countries, which we'll be hearing from later on. So thank you, Viliami, for that. Um, we're going to move swiftly on to our next speaker, who is Professor Aya Abe um, from Tokyo Metropolitan University in Japan. Uh, Professor Abe holds a PhD uh, from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University in the States. Um, after working at the United Nations and the Japanese Aid Agency, she's worked for 16 years at the National Institute of Population and Social Security Research, um, and in 2015 took up a professorship at Tokyo Metropolitan University and established, importantly, the Center for Research on Child and Adolescent Poverty there. Her interests include poverty, particularly child poverty, but also inequality and social exclusion in Japan. Um, and she will be talking to us today about whether or not we're getting closer to consensus um, and analysis of changes in socially perceived necessities over time in Japan. Um, Professor Abe, if you would. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. I'm very honored to be here. Um, I have cited many of your your work over my um, my um, you know career and you know. I'm very honored to be here to be among you. Uh, today, I'm going to present about um, uh, the recent study I did about uh, pu um, publicly perceived um, necessities. And so I'm, um, I was a bit um, um, re uh, reluctant to say, to say that I, I did not cover the entire poverty studies in Japan, which are many, and, and I really would like to, to introduce that. But today, I'm just going to talk about a little portion of my work, which I did very recently. Let me share my slides. And it is about um, perceived necessities in Japan. And before going to that, let me just explain a little bit about the situation in Japan in terms of poverty index. And we do use the 50% medium equivalent household income um, as an official public um, poverty measure, uh, which is published by the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare. And in, two, in 2013, when the law to promote measures against child poverty was enacted, uh, the government did consider some deprivation scales to uh, identified by the consensus approach and selected uh, a few items as indicators to monitor poverty. And which was a really big win for me because um, I was uh, advocating for using the deprivation foot scale for a long time for the Japanese government. But however, recently in 2022, we have the new code, the basic law for children, which kind of encompasses the, the 2013 law as well. And in it, it just uh, um, selected a whole bunch, about 30 indicators, including things like like um, high school dropout rate and all those things, but none are about the deprivation standard of living. So I was a bit disappointed to hear that. Um, so, but that's the state in Japan right now in terms of using the deprivation scale as a, a official poverty measure. And my work is uh, looking into um, the consensual approach of this deprivation index. And of course, we all know that to identify correct items to construct a valid deprivation scale, um, there are four um, tests that we, we have to, to cast on the items, uh, suitability and validity and reliability and additivity. And these are all well documented. And, and I'm sure the people who are in, uh, listening to us right now are, are some of the people who have devised all these tests. And my um, interest is in the suitability test. Um, so far, I from what the previous studies, I see there are three ways to uh, conduct a suitability test. One is um, objective where the scientists um, say that this is this item is suitable. And the second one is a consumption based where we, we can say like say if the 70% of the population you consumes this item or have this item, this item is a necessity. 
And the third is a consensual approach, which was mentioned by both of the speakers uh, previous to me, um, which is asking the public's view in deciding what is necessary for the society. And I think this is not only uh, just reflecting the public's view um, and going away from the um, more um, paternalistic way of deciding things, but it is a way to decide the definition of a poverty by democratic way, because by selecting an item is a is a necessity, and it is if if it is is agreed by the public, we are in a way saying that the public is is saying that this is something that not needs something should be about. I mean, the missing of this item is something that the, the society as a whole has to do something to do about and which is the, basically the definition of a poverty. Um, so I, I think this consensual approach is a very important way of deciding what is poverty. And even among these public um, uh, consensus clubs, there are several ways. Um, one is focus groups, like Maggie mentioned earlier. And another way is more lengthy way is to conduct a separate survey and probably on top of the of the focus groups. Uh, and third way is more um, is combining the the two surveys, the necessity survey and also deprivation survey in the same in the same questionnaire. So in the one question you say, do you think this item is necessary? And then in the next question you say, do you have this item? And if you do not. Um, is it because you cannot afford it? Um, this is just showing, and I'm sure you cannot read all this, these studies, uh, but uh, some of the studies that have used different ways, and you, you can see that, for example, the PSC surveys are using more or less the separate survey, where many of the um, um, consensual approach used in other countries are using two-stage questionnaire, which is probably uh, less costly. And some of us are relying on focus groups and or focus groups and two-stage questionnaire and so forth. But when it comes to um, the children's deprivation items, um, the question gets a bit more complicated because now we have to ask, who do we need to ask the necessity question? Or do we ask the general public or the parents or children? The ch child-centric approach um, is advocating for the that we ask children because children's opinion should matter in definition of poverty, and which is I think is is a very is is a very noble way to do that. But um, if we think about um, the public's view and if it's a democratic way to decide on what needs to be done, there is a point of asking to the general public, even though some of these people may not have children or um, or you know are in a situation that they themselves are, are, are in a dire situation as well. Because, I mean, if we were to use the taxpayers' money, we need to have the general public's um, uh, agreement that this item is a necessity for, that, for children in that society, right? And um, in the past studies, there are many people uh, way of doing that. Some of them ask for parents, some of them ask the children themselves, and some of them ask the, the general public, like this one, uh, the EU one. And uh, using the different methods, like focus groups and separate surveys and so forth. Having said that, my question is, uh, how stable is the list of deprivation items over that long time? And there are many ways that um, public perception may change. For example, technological change, or societal preference change, or um, more uh, discreetly that changes in age composition or changes in socioeconomic status composition. Because even though we do check for the consensus between uh, groups in the society, there are slight changes and uh, differences in their opinions. And if, if there are changes happening because of these kind of things, uh, we have to ask two questions. Um, if um, um, the if we use the majority rule of using fifty percent as as a criterion for or making this as a as a society uh, perceived of necessities, if it drops below fifty percent just because of a demographic change, is that a real change or not? 
And second thing is, if um, if there's a democratic change, or if maybe there are more um, um, is the consensus between the groups widening or or getting narrower, and if it's widening, even if that percent is more than fifty percent overall, can we still consider that item to be a necessity? And actually, there are several studies looking at the um, um, changes of the social possible necessities over time. And um, one is in Vietnam, and there are a bunch of them from PSE, and many of you, uh, the authors are, are here in the conference. And however, um, relatively small amount of analysis is done in terms of looking at the consensus of the different groups, subgroups within the society. Overall, they agree that aggregate level of support remains fairly stable over time. Uh, but however, uh, um, except maybe for um, the one by um, Pantages Gordon and Townsend in 2006, they did not really look into the changes into the consensus among the subgroups. So my questions so are this. I'm going to skip through this a little bit more. And I'm going to use the five surveys which I conducted over the years from 2003 to 2022. And some of them are using uh, internet surveys and some of them are using mail, um, um, mail collected um, um, collection method. And, but the questionnaire is more or less the same. And I'm going to use the, um, this number of items are uh, about 2,000 2, respondents all together. Here is the result, uh, just a descriptive result. Um, the red dotted line is the support rate, which is the percentage of the people who said this is a necessity. Um, and I line them up from the lower one to a higher one. And the other lines are from other studies. So you can see that there are a lot of ups and downs. Like for example, items like this has really went up in the in the um in the support rate, but there are some that went down as well, like like this one. And overall, 2011 was the one that showed highest support, but 2022 it went down a little bit. And you can see the items from like doctors, like some of these items. This item is shoes, two pairs of shoes. Um, it has really gained a lot of, of support over the years, but there are other ones that really did not change at all, like for example, Christmas present over, over here. Here showing some of this. And research question one says, has the rate of support for items such as social possibility necessity changed over time? And if so, has it changed even after controlling for demographic and economic changes? And uh, it is, I have used the logistic regression controlling for um, our dependent um, characteristics mm -hmm. like uh, age, gender, and household income quintile, as well as whether they have children or not. And eight items showed statistically significant increase, and eight items showed statistically significant decrease. So I can see, like in other studies, some of the items gained support and some of them did uh, lost the support. And the second and third questions are, has the change support been in the same direction? Um, for example, if the support rate for um, for an item is gaining this the, um, is is gaining, is it is it gaining throughout the subsection of the society? Or, or and are we moving closer to the consensus? And for to do this, I use the um, cross terms of ear dummies. Um, uh, uh, I introduce this to the uh, equations so that uh, I can see the um, the ear uh, variation of the of the each um, each um, subdivision subgroups. And here are the predicted values. Mm -hmm. Holding the cons holding the rest of the um characteristics at the midpoint. <laughs> okay. And uh, showing, for example, here I'm showing the, the predictive values for two pairs of shoes that fit. Just hold a minute. 
。しんどさん、しゃべらないでごめん。<笑> Sorry, I just told my secretary not to speak. <laughs> so, and、uh, you can see this is between two sexes, men and women, and over the years. And, and this is for people who have children, for people who do not. And this is showing the age groups, and this is showing the, the income quintile. And you can see that you know, the lines are more or less parallel. Showing that they are all gaining the weight in the same direction. And actually, the,、uh, the, um, there is a fairly close、uh, consensus among the population. So, so we can definitely say that two pairs of shoes that fit is、uh, an item that gained,、um, and, uh, and they gained support. But other items, for example,、uh, like separate bedrooms for boys and girls above age 10. You can see, like over here, this is for people who have children, people who do not. And in 2011, these two groups had fairly the same amount.、Uh, like I said, this is the predicted values after controlling for all other variables. So、um, this is disregarding all the demographic change and all sorts of things, other things. But in 2022, I mean, there is a slight overlap of I mean, 95% of confidence interval still, but you can see the, the gap is pretty wide. And for age groups,、uh, if you look at the, the ones that in 2011, the, the confidence intervals pretty much really overlap. But in 2020, there are groups that really、um, didn't, do not overlap at all. And for、um, this is income quintile, and you can see some people remain stay stable and some people really gain access. Five minutes left, Professor Ali. And this is visiting a doctor, which we would think that everyone would agree that is a necessity, but however, it, actually, it decreased over the years. And in,、like、even between men and women, it used to be pretty much the same, but in 2022, there is a difference between men and women. And same with the people who have children and not. And there are also、um, the differences, is wider, the, the gap is widening for between age groups. So I'm going to speak this is the same thing. So I put this all together, and this is showing、um, whether the, each item is moving in the same direction on these four columns by groups, subgroups. And this is showing whether they're getting closer. And you can see. They are a lot more blues than compared to pinks. And the blue ones are the ones、um, that, that they more or less are getting、uh, wider in terms of the gap between the subgroups. And she is the one that is getting closer. So basically, between sexes, most of the things are getting closer. And there are only two items that are getting wider. And, but for age groups, Most of them are getting wider or stable. And people who have children or not, only Y item is getting closer, but most of them are not. So, what is saying that、um, even though for those items that h a s gained a lot of support, support over the years, it is not really a, um, um, agreed upon、uh, increase. It is more of, of, of disagreement is getting bigger. So, lastly, the discussion taking point from this, this analysis. Actually, if we use the 50% rule, the most of the SPAs were fairly stable. The only one that changed was the shoes,、uh, two pairs of shoes that fit, which gained the more than 50% of the, the support afterwards、uh, compared to before. But,、um, And, and this is also showing the support rate for items in Japan did not really increase over the 20 years, which is a really long time. And during this time, we had the law to promote、uh, um, measures against child poverty. And we also have a whole bunch of new um, um, policies for child poverty, but this did not really get、uh, accompanied by the change in, in, in、uh, public's perception of what is necessary for children. But having said that,、um, there is a wider consensus, uh, 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 I mean, a wider disagreement、um, between the subgroups. So, which means that、uh, whose consensus should we really、um, 
look at? Um, should we just look at the entire population's consensus or should we look at only parents or only children? Because um, I'm thinking more and more, like, trying to get the 50% growth over the entire population is becoming harder and harder, at least for Japan. So um, maybe we need to change um, the way to change uh, to pick what is the socially perceived necessities. Um, and however, we I need to have to say that there is a limitation of the study that comparing five surveys using different modes of collection is a problematic. And even though I have controlled for uh, possible biases um, de depending on the collection method. Um, there might be some uncontrolled for or biases remaining. So this should be taken uh, with a grain of salt, but still I think it is a very important. Um, um, it is it sets a great, very important light into uh, how we should think about socially perceived necessities in future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Abe. Absolutely spot on time. Very, very interesting questions that are being asked that will apply to all studies using the approach around the world. Um, it was interesting. I think the the in Korea they have a, a a survey of children where they ask both parents and children as well, and this one is repeated in multiple rounds of data. So applying your analysis to that sort of survey where they both ask the adults and the children within the same national survey will be very, very interesting. So I'm going to steal your idea and approach my colleagues in Seoul <laughs> to, to see if we can if we can do what you've been doing to investigate that. OK, moving to our final speaker for the session uh, for this but for this first session of, of, of the conference today. Um, it's Dr. Choje Shi. Uh, from the University of Bristol, who is a um, Dr. Shi is a lecturer in quantitative human geography at the School of Geographical Sciences at the University of Bristol. Um, before this, she was a Boyer postdoctoral fellow at Peking University and a Clarendon doctoral scholar at the University of Oxford. Uh, her scholarship employs comparative and critical perspectives and uses quantitative methods and state of the art visualizations to analyze the emerging transformations in population, economy, and space in urban China. And she's particularly interested in social and spatial inequalities in megacities, of which there are <laughs> no shortage of in China, I'm guessing. So it's a growing, literally a growing body of work to see there. Um, and today we'll be hearing from her about multiple vulnerabilities and migrant and local disparities in China's urban labor market during the zero COVID era. So Dr. Shi, welcome and thank you. Thank you, Shana. Thanks for the very nice um, introduction. And here is my slides. And today, like um, Shana introduced, I'm going to talk about multiple vulnerabilities, which I think quite resonates with Maggie's presentation about multidimensional approach to inequality and poverty. So today I am going to talk about urban labor market in zero COVID era. Um, job losses, income reductions, and responses to job losses, which are three dimensionals that I'm going to focus on. So the first section is a brief like introduction and background of the whole topic, whereas the three remaining sections are three dimensions that I'm focusing on. Uh, first of all, urban labor market in zero COVID era. Um, as we all know, China has undergone like unprecedented lens of zero COVID policy, which is a policy that has been actually implemented in many other countries like China alone at the initial stage. However, during the um, Delta variant, many countries have abandoned this zero COVID policy because it's so hard to contaminate the transmissible Delta variant, whereas China has continued this zero COVID um, policy, and which makes China become a country that has imposed um, lockdowns for several times. So um, given our kind of great literature review, there are five key periods of lockdown in China. But before proceeding these five periods, I would like to mention that actually national wide lockdown in China has not occurred. These lockdowns are very localized, but has spread it across China different locations which make um, the lockdown quite seem widespread. So the five period um, is um, is stocked is stocked gray here. 
So first one is the Hubei lockdown, which has the was the first wave of zero COVID in 2020. And then the two lockdowns in the middle in 2021 was partial lockdown in northern part of China. And then the Delta variant swept, swept the China, which induced the third lockdown. And the fourth and fifth are major city lockdowns, which was due to the Omicron variant. And these two lockdowns were quite well, quite well low across the world because it occurred in mega and major cities, which has provoked huge protest across China about the zero COVID policy, which in the end led to the abandon of zero COVID policy in China at the end of 2022 November. And as you can see, this, this is also um, the urban unemployment rate during the zero COVID era. And we can see actually during the five lockdowns, there are five spikes. Cho, do, in... do you mind if I interrupt? I'm really sorry to interrupt you. We can't yeah. see the slides changing on your, on our screens. Oh, uh... <laughs> oh, sorry. That's, That's okay. oh. oh, there we go. Sorry. There we go. Yeah, yeah, Thank sorry. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And here is a five, um, okay. You, you don't miss a lot of things, just one picture. <laughs> so here are the uh, five, um, uh, major lockdowns in China during the zero COVID era, and the y-axis is urban unemployment rate. So you can see during the five lockdowns I just mentioned, there are five spikes in urban unemployment rate in China. But what, what I want to say is that actually the second and third lockdown and the kind of urban unemployment rate accomplished this are not due to the lockdown measures. As you can see, before the pandemic, in January the 2019 and July 2019, the urban unemployment has also wrote, has also increased as well. And this increase is due to the spring festival, people change jobs during this period, and also due to the graduation season, because many young people go to the job market and they do not have like have um have a period that, that cannot find a job. So basically the urban unemployment rate increased only due to three periods due to lockdown measures. The first is the initial wave, which is the Hubei lockdown that we all know, and, and also due to major city lockdowns. So you can see how important the major city is to the employment and how these lockdowns on major cities can affect a large number of people who were employed by that time. And why I would like to focus on the local migrants and inequalities in this period, it is because in China, actually, uh, migrants are and local residents are defined by the household registration system, which is sort of an internal passport in China. So for people migrating from origin to destination, some of them would kind of naturalized of um, becoming the destination residents by obtaining the local kind of passport there. So they are um, together with the natives become the local residents, whereas migrants are defined in China as those who do not have the local sort of passport or household registration there. And in 2021, according to our survey, that actually in the urban labor market, those migrants that who do not have the household registration um, has already made up over one, over one third of the um, urban labor force, which means that actually any inequality between these two groups can affect over, over one third of the uh, labor force, which can um, lead to a significant kind of disadvantage of a large portion of the labor force. And why um, this how to, why this household registration is really important and it's really significant to the inequality between migrants and locals, it is because this household registration defines the access to certain valuable resources in the place of residence. The first resource is the certain jobs in public sectors, such as uh, civil servants or like transport tra or, or workers in the state-owned companies. And these jobs are usually more resilient to external shocks, which can lead to the job and income, income vulnerability of the migrants in cities. And the second resource is the services and benefits essential to settle down in cities, such as the access to education, access to medical services. And this kind of lack of access to, to, to such essential services 
would make migrants to choose the um, split household way of life, which can in turn make them more vulnerable to um, external economic shocks such as the COVID pandemic induced um, economic downturn. And the third um, resource is the public funds. So if you were uh, losing your job, if you are migrants in cities, you do not have access to public funds, to unemployment benefits, which means that migrants in China are uh, more uh, have, have a heavier uh, reliance on work as uh, compared to local residents, which makes them uh, may behave differently, have different responses to the job losses due to economic downturns. So these are three possible mechanisms that can lead to the migrant local disparities in urban China during the COVID period. And here comes the three um, dimensions of the multiple vulnerabilities. The first one, uh, oh, before proceeding that, um, this is the data we're using, which is um, data collected by Peking University in 2022 um, and covers 32 cities and 25,000 households. And in this survey, we specifically included the um, for, um, a section detailing the information on the impact of the COVID-19 on their employment situation, which enabled us to do this research. So um, the first dimension, job losses, as you can see in this graph, so the x-axis is a time and the y-axis is a cumulative share of people who have lost a job due specifically to COVID-19. And as you can see, there's a huge gap between uh, migrants and locals, whereas by the end of our survey, there are 3.5% of migrants who have had um, job losses due to uh, COVID-19. This share for locals were um, 2,002.7, a gap of 0.8. But um, if you see the bottom line um, closely, you can see actually the gap does not increase continuously, but mainly during two periods. The first uh, is the um, is between December the 19th and February the 2020, and the second is again December and March. So what what happened in this period? One thing is that actually in this these these two periods um, are the Spring Festival in China, a time when migrants would usually go back home to un to reunite with their families that cannot be settling down in cities due to the restrictions. So when they go back to their hometown and during this time, there are lockdowns and then they cannot go back to the city to work. So this kind of synchronization of spring festival and lockdown measures are the reason why the local and migrants differ in the chances of losing jobs during the COVID-19 period in China. So as um, during, um given the kind of sort of framework um, indicated earlier. Um, as you can see, um, this kind of gap between um, local migrants in terms of job losses uh, are mainly impacted by the split household arrangement, which in turn is partly affected by the services and benefits uh, essentially set down uh, in cities are lacking for migrants. And so that's the first, first dimension. And the second dimension is income losses. As you can see in this in this uh, bar graph, um, a, approximately 44% of migrants have had income losses due to COVID-19, whereas this share was 42.5% uh, for locals, a 2% um, difference, not really huge to be honest, but still statistically significant. And a closer look at uh, why they're different, we can see actually, if we arrange the income losses by employer type, as you can see in the uh, left hand of the bar graph, those in public sectors were the least um, that might um, experience income losses during the COVID and um, zero COVID um, era. Um, but if you can see on the right hand side, the migrants are uh, underrepresented in all of these public sector, which in turn make them more vulnerable for to income losses. So as I said before, actually the restriction of um, 
uh, migrants to certain jobs in the public sector, which are the least likely to be affected by the pandemic, has contributed to their income vulnerability as compared to the local residents. So that's the second dimension. And last but not the least, the third dimension is the responses to job losses. So as you can see in this um, um, bar graph here, which shows um, whether they would leave the labor market after the job loss, loss a lot. So as you can see, after um, losing the jobs, um, local residents, um, for approximately 40% of local residents leave the labor market after the job loss, whereas this share is 20, 26% for migrants. So basically migrants are less likely to leave the labor market after the job loss. However, if we can see more clearly between the two, um, two, two different responses, we can see actually this might not be a choice, but a necessity for migrants to remain in the labor market to earn a living so that they can live in cities. So, um, uh, and this conclusion can be seen from, um, from this kind of huge gap between migrants and locals in terms of whether they uh, would leave the landmark would leave the labor market after an unsuccessful job search period. So 12% of local workers would leave, the labor, would leave the labor market after an unsuccessful job search period, whereas this share among migrants is extremely low at 1%, which means that actually if the migrants decided to stay in the labor market in the initial stage, they have to stay, they will stay, even though the um, job searching might be quite challenging for them, they still want to stay in the labor market, which sort of suggests that staying in the labor market might not be a choice, but to be a necessity to survive in cities. So um, um, the conclusion or the take home messages for this work is that actually over 50% of the urban labor force in China was affected by the pandemic, although the impact was manifested primarily as minor income decline. And as I said previously, um, this kind of impact was most significant when the lockdown was imposed on mega cities um, and major cities in China. So that's the overarching picture. Uh, for the three dimensions is that actually the circular nature of migration and the synchronization of family reunion re reunion and travel restrictions combined to make um, migrants more vulnerable to job losses to, uh, as compared to local residents. And this kind of um, conclusion highlights, actually we need to pay particular focus on the temporalities of behaviors and therefore to the temporalities of policy inclinations. And third, um, underrepresentation in more resilient sectors, which is partly due to the household, registr household registration system, do make a contribution to uh, the more income losses among migrants than among local residents, uh, which shows that actually the dual labor market thing in China has a significant impact on um, people's different uh, results during the economic downturns. So for this part, maybe, um, to reduce or to uh, eliminate the institutional barriers to make the dual labor market into a single labor market is the most important policy that needs to be done in the future if we do not want migrants to bear, um, on, bear an improportionate burden of the economic downturns. And thirdly, and fourthly, heavy reliance on work income and uh, limited saving among migrants make them have to find a job as soon as possible after the loss of their job, which might lead to the working poor population in China in the future and might be a point that needs particular policy attention as well. Anyway, um, so all this kind of conclusion uh, leads to one single message, which again echoes uh, Maggie's message, is that the vulnerabilities are multidimensional and we need to focus on different dimensions rather than a single dimension of the vulnerability suffered by migrants in China. That's it. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Chojo. I um I didn't interrupt 15 minutes in because I thought you were coming to the end of what's a very, very interesting um piece of work. I'm I'm hoping you've you've published it somewhere so that we can read and get more details of it. And if you could share that through the BPI, if you have published this work, it would be really interesting, I think, to many of the audience here to 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 read up on it in, in more detail. 15 minutes or 18 minutes doesn't really give people to, <laughs> the opportunity to do justice to what's really, really interesting work. Um, so th this is the the sort of we we've had our four excellent speakers and um, we we now have between twenty twenty five minutes I'm guessing of time for questions to the panel. Um, please remember that we're going to be doing these through the Q and A uh, Q and A option down down below. Lauren, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and yes, please submit your questions through there. Please also identify, are, are we getting people to actually ask questions through cameras, Lauren? And I'm not entirely sure, I'm sorry. Or is it only through the Q&A function? Um, we, we were going to try and use the, the Q&A function. Okay. So okay. if that's, yeah. Not having used it before, you'll forgive me. <laughs> I hope. But yes, please, um, please submit your questions via the Q&A function um, and ensure that you are showing your name and preferably your institution or where you're based, that we, we can have some sort of background. Please specify to whom the question is aimed at or whether it's a general question to the panel as a whole. And I'm sure I don't have to say this, but I've been asked to. Please be respectful in your questions and comments. Um, and the chair, um, sorry, and, and we may be, we may remove anyone who's being deliberately prov provocative or offensive, which I don't believe anyone would be, at least not this early in the day. So if you'd like to submit any questions through, um, those would be good. I'm assuming they're in, in the open section there. Uh, while we wait for a couple of, well, while we wait for, for people, I'm going to take Chair's privilege, if that's possible, to ask a question um, of, of Maggie, um, and of Aya, I suppose, given the work that you've been doing, um, and and maybe also to Viliami, this idea of um, the idea of adaptive preferences in terms of when we're talking about attitudes changing, um, and I think it was Maggie who who mentioned this idea. No, it wasn't. It was um, it was a, sorry, it was it was another work there. Um, but do you see any evidence in when we're talking about changing in attitudes? of this creeping idea of adaptive preferences coming into the work that you've been using in, in Hong Kong and in Japan, um, and whether or not that provides a challenge to or problems for the consensual approach and its use in, in the context in, 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 in where you're working. Are, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Maggie, do you want to say first? Uh because I think uh, one of um, our study is um, try to compare um, the difference between adults and children, but uh, we didn't did the similar thing with uh, Professor Abby did. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we just tried to make the um, compare the gener generational differences between adult and children. It's, but you weren't I controlling think... for sort of wealthier adults versus less wealthy adults, wealthier children versus wealth. Or, or um, it was just a generational approach, I suppose. Yes, to... yes, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And for me, not with this data, but uh, with the previous data, I did uh, compare the adaptive preferences of children um, depending on their income groups, and which is in the child indicators research some years ago. Um, and I did find that the wealthier, I mean, the poorer children tended to say things are not necessary for some items, but the degree is not as strong as in, in adults. And, and I tried to construct a deprivation scale using only those things that did not show any adaptive. There are items that did not show any adaptive preference, mm -hmm. like iPhone, which is like like liked by everyone. But you know, but for other things, there are some some things, and and um, I did try to use some um, differentiated items and use the different created two different uh, indexes, and they perform almost the same. Right. So um, I think uh, I, I agree with uh, and the conclusion um, posed by Dr. Harrod a long time ago that saying the adaptive preference is there, but it's not going to affect the, the result so much. 
see Dave nodding. I don't have any questions in the in the Q&A section box. Dave, did you have some questions? I, uh, Professor Abbey, could you uh, just uh, say, uh, because we were one of your surveys was after the pandemic and the others were before, if you think some of the differences were due to a pandemic effect that uh, different genders, different age groups reacted differently to all the public health interventions and therefore what they considered to be necessities for uh, extra rooms for children, for example, uh, or whether you think it's a longer term trend. Um, I think it's a longer term trend because I'm looking at the data from 2003 and it's not just the, the, um, the last segment that, that we see a difference, but it's, I see it from throughout the different uh, the ages. And actually, the, 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 the year that had highest uh, support rate for a lot of things was 2011, which is right after the, the big uh, recession in Japan. So that was more than um, in 2022, which is a few years after the COVID. And uh, actually the poverty, ch child poverty rate went down quite a lot on during 2020 and because of the government handouts and even 2021 and 2022, because our um, our economy did not get, get affected as much as in some of, of the European countries or other countries, maybe in China. And we only had like three months of lockdown. And actually the mother's uh, employment rent went up quite considerably during this time. And, and um, the income as a whole for the, the children, uh, household with children uh, is going up. And we are seeing in that in recently that some families who, who, are, who could not raise their, their, their income during this time are the ones who are suffering the most because of the high prices. Um, we're, we're still waiting for questions, and I'm, I'm hoping panel um, participants can put questions in, in the thing. I hope the Q&A function box is actually working. Does someone want to test it <laughs> out of interest? Um, but I did have... Um, what what Professor Abe just said just reminded me of something and relating to what Viliami in his role as a sort of a, a government statistician and the COVID presented lots of challenges to everyone everywhere, but particularly to national stats offices who not only are dealing with collecting data in dangerous times. Um I'm I'm wondering, Viliami, from I'm not I'm not asking you to speak on behalf of the World Bank <laughs> or or international donors, but has there been uh, additional resources made available to national stats offices that facilitate the collection of data post the COVID period in light of the greater demands for data for the reporting process for the SDGs? Is there something you might say, or I mean, has there been a, a freeing up of resources or are they more available for, for NSOs in the region through the SBC or other words? Well, thank you, Sol. And I think uh, there's a mixed, mixed uh, approaches here. Um, with relating to, I, I just want to el uh, elaborate a little bit of what I was trying to say earlier, and then I'll come back to your questions. Uh, in relation to consensual approach, it has been evidently shown that it's very powerful in terms of, of its predicting power in terms of uh, identifying those people who are poor in, in our region. And the fact that the COVID and other shocks are happening, it tells us the, the fact that we need to collect more frequent uh, uh, data and not just waiting for a five-year period national collection. Uh, that, is, that is not uh, going to, uh, to affect our, our, our poverty because additionally with the fact of uh, of the dynamic and and how severity of poor is is more distorting in our environment, um, uh, it's it's a big call for me. It's a big call for for government statisticians to make uh, continuous um, uh, with the real time data on poverty, so that we can we can even when the shock comes in between any time that we can reflect some proxy estimates and, and, and the consensual indicators, approach indicators, 
is very powerful in terms of having those uh, simple uh, and and cost effective type of indicators to to tell us the story of where the people are. Uh, in fact, the with the <clears throat> with the pertinence of uh, statisticians, particularly with the uh, government statisticians in our region, yes, uh, we are expecting to report um, on on many many different development agendas. Not only our local, uh, our national reporting uh, requirements, uh, where we have uh, our, our our corporate plan, we have our strategic plan. And we have our overarching, I'll give an example for Kiribati. They have a KV20, which talks about uh, from 2016 to 2036. It's a 20 uh, development agenda. And they have a lot of indicators, let alone their strategic development agenda. And let alone the SDGs, the international, we have regional uh, development agenda where the reporting requirements in, in particular with poverty has, has a lot of mandate. And, and and some of the frustration happens because they they the the understanding of of what's what's uh, what most appropriate and I give an example in Tonga because it's not just for the reporting of the SDGs it's a reporting for our national leaders who wanted us to do something about our set project our our they wanted us to scope out where where are the poor household with children. At this particular time, that happens on a time where we didn't have our data. Our data was about four years old on on our highs. So, with this demand that is 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 growing, and that's why I showed from MDGs to SDG, it's already big enough. And with the 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 non clarity of realigning development agenda and having priorities and having the right tool at the right time is also a challenge let alone the funding. And now with the bilateral, a, a lot of other development partners coming with their own, own methodologies to advocate. And because they're having the funding, that is, a, that is a, another, another power for them to make it happen in countries. But for me, uh, personally, I, I advocate for what is, for, so that we can do justice in our role in terms of, uh, of, of, uh, of informed decisions. We have to lead because the, the mandate for statisticians to have informed decisions and have evidences to make sure that we use an appropriate methodology and ideologies that scope out our context. And yes, the, 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 the agenda for funding is also uh, needed, in my view, to have a proper coordination, not only locally, but also internationally, because bilateral, even within UN, UN agencies, UN UN FPA is totally different mandate from with UNDB and so forth. That's very interesting, Viliami, to hear that those who have the money can get the ask the questions the way they want, <laughs> possibly over the heads of um those who probably want to do it more appropriately or better for their regions and their own region. So, so colonialism's not entirely dead then, um, I'm guessing. Um I understand Professor Abe would like to ask um, um, Maggie a question. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask uh, to use this moment to ask this um, burning question that I've been struggling with to Maggie. And um, I have been working with a child-centric approach as well. And I have try, I've been trying to con construct a child deprivation scale uh, using child answers. And but what I'm seeing is that um, deprivation scale using child answers tend not to um, really correlate with with um, um, with poverty, and it does not pass the four tests that is is developed by Dave Gordon and, and and others. So, and then I then I try to see the the um, overlap between the mothers. Um, uh, mother's uh, deprivation and child deprivation, trying to see the parental sacrifice part. But then I'm seeing there are a lot of children um, uh, uh, who, are, are not, who are deprived in very high income groups where mother's deprivation is very low. So I mean, then, you know, as a poverty research, I mean, I mean think I'm right, like really, really, like what is that, that, that the thing that I'm trying to analyze, you know? and and how do you um 
compensate for that? I mean, do you have the same kind of problem with um, Hong Kong data? Uh, from our data, um, I mean, the child deprives of depression. We we find, uh, as I said, we find an interesting thing is um, because we will expect those kids living in poor family, they are material deprived. But from our findings, we find those who are living in the lowest quartile, they are not material deprived. There's some kids. That's why we think uh, because of their parents sacrifice their need to fulfill what um, actually their children um, think is necessary. So um, um, the other example that I show from the data is um, we really find there's a um, kind of difference, um, but um, in general, actually the items, I mean, in terms of the differences is not um, say one is uh, below 50%, but just there's some variation. Uh, because apart from the survey data, before the data collection, we also um, conduct some focus group. I'll take one example. I think it's very common in um, Asian country that the kids will join the um, after school tutorial class. Um, we raised this item to uh, for the focus group. The kids will say, um, they will first beginning, um, they will say, um, not compared with other items, they, they may not think in, in, in terms of priority, they may not put that is at the top um, compared with like mobile phone or computer with internet. But um, when we keep on talking, they will, got some sense this is really important. Um, what I want to say is um, when we say um, there's a difference, it's not really say that they, they don't think that part is a necessity, but they they have they, they still need to prioritize, um, but not different from their parents or adult thing. Um, if you refer to my slide, um, almost 17% um, the child necessity, the, the parents, 70 to almost 100%, they think the less is um, uh, from the parents' perspective, they think it's necessity. It's different from the kids, um, the varies from 53 to 95%. I mean, um, I think um, from this part, it's very interesting because um, if we just rely on the parents' perspective, we think all the items is, um, is essential. But um, in reality, when we consult the um, kids' opinion, is not really. There's still, um, they have their agenda and their priority in terms of the child necessity. Yeah. It wouldn't be the first time that parents and children disagreed on what's good for them. <laughs> um, Dave, I see you have your hand up. Yeah. Like to ask you. I was just going to also add that uh, the next talk after the break will be by uh, Dr. Alba Lanu, who's been looking at, uh, at least part, partly answering your question, which is looking at intra-household uh, differences in, in poverty and deprivation uh, across all the countries in the European Union. Uh, so she's, she's going to talk about that, that uh, research that she's been, she's been doing. So uh, that may provide some, some answers, at least for Europe, or, or obviously things may be dead different in Japan. Yes. Thank you for that plug, Dave, for the next session. Um, I don't see any other. There was one other question I actually do have, if I might ask it, is um, you both pointed out that sort of with the, even with the cross-sectional data, we we're able to look at the different groups of risks, um, the poor, the non-poor, but the vulnerable and those who are sort of rising out of poverty. And when we did some work in South Korea with, with data on South Korea, what surprised us was, yes, you had very relatively low levels of poor, multidimensional poor, but a very sizable chunk at risk or vulnerable to poverty, which I'm assuming something like the COVID shock or in the case of Tonga, the, the volcano going up or any number or, or a hurricane coming in. What's the, um, in, at least in Hong Kong and Japan, were you able to see what proportion of the population or are at in that sort of vulnerable group that don't really get dealt with because they're not technically poor yet 
but we're just above either just above the poverty line there, but who might well fall into poverty. And what's the sort of relative share of that group to the non-poor? Sorry, not the non-poor, to the, the poor group. Because if, we, if you're talking about doubling or trebling your numbers in poverty with a very sort of immediate shock, that has real implications for, for governments and what they need to do. And that was to sort of back your eye. Um, for for me, I don't have the number of them because what you're talking about those people who are, uh, not income, um, no, who are income poor but not uh, deprivation poor, right? Um, yeah. so I sorry, I don't have the, the number right off hand, but I do think that the other group could also be a problem as well for those people who are, um, you know, um, who have high income but low um deprivation so because that means that that they might have very high consumption needs or some other um reasons that that they their income is not sufficient to meet meet their um their to keep their you know standard of living so i think we need to look at the both groups <laughs> Thank you. And Maggie, did you have a sense of this, the relative size of those different groups between the vulnerable to poverty as opposed to the uh, we we uh, we don't have the update um, data right. at the moment in Hong Kong. But uh, I think because of the pandemic recession, I think more people we we will become more vulnerable. I mean, to this this group, yeah. We have we have five minutes left, and everyone is letting me down in terms of questions in the questions box. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to double check: is the Hukou system still applied in China, or has that been done away with? Is it still working? If it's it's interesting to see a policy that clearly is structurally driving poverty or disadvantage or deprivation amongst a sizable proportion of the population is still there. Is it still in play? Mm, I think. Is is still in play, but it's different from previous years. Oh, um, because um, previously it's between urban and rural uh, hukou, and now it's more localized. Um, so for medium and small sized cities, this kind of institution doesn't have any function anymore. Because now almost all the um, public services can be accessed by all the population in medium and small cities. Um, well, as for mega cities like Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, these kind of huge cities with great public services, huge demands, and huge um, um, number of migrants, this kind of institution is still working their way. So I would say it has been transformed from a divide between urban and rural to a divide between um, mega cities and the rest of China. And uh, we had a paper recently also related to COVID published in Urban Studies um, telling this transformation um, between uh, transformation from Hukou type, which is rural urban, to Hukou place, which is mega city and normal cities, and how this kind of transformation is actually linked to the overall political economy of China, which has evolved over the past 30 years. So this institution is is a means for the state to achieve the development goals as this kind of developmental goals changed uh, the way this institution operates changed as well and the livelihoods affected by institution has also changed. I see Dave's got his hand up again. Um... I, <laughs> yes, I also had a, a question for Dr. Xi. Um, mm. You you described how the hukou is changing, but uh, for any given level of income, because of the restriction on services, are migrant workers with a rural hukou uh, put tend to be? Do, are they poorer than than uh, the uh, people with an urban hukou uh, because of the service rest access restriction, or, or 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 has that also disappeared in in, in some parts of China? Mm. That kind of restrictions to services has disappeared, like I said, in medium and small size cities, but still exists in mega cities. So I think in mega cities, um, 
internal migrants in China without a local hukou is quite similar to illegal migrants in the UK. So sometimes they might need to accept lower income because they do not have this kind of backup insurance. So I think the employer can kind of exploit this kind of lack of access to certain things to to kind of reduce their income. However, in middle-sized and small-sized cities, apart from huge migrant cities and large cities, the rest of the China, I would say the difference between migrants and locals are very small now. And also there's a trending, there's a trend in China, actually migrants are no longer restricted to rural to urban as China has urbanized to a great extent. So now I think urban to urban migration maybe account like half half um, of rural urban. So like migration has itself has also diversified over the past 30 years. Thank you all. I've um... As 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 we approach ten o'clock, I'm I'm wondering about the unintended consequences of presentations at conferences, particularly since we're going to be going forward to say we're going to ban the Spring Festival going forward as a way of protecting jobs in China. So congratulations. <laughs> Officially, we're going to ban Christmas as well to prevent mm -hmm. that. Um, so we've got a, we've got a few minutes left before the end of play. That's not an official BPI recommendation to the government of China. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's just to say uh, oh, well I'd like to say thank you to for our four speakers um, and for engaging with with um, with the questions and and for for giving up your time for being part of this and also for staying up beyond the call uh, I'll, I'll say good night to, to to several of you very very shortly uh, just a quick reminder on on my papers here that the event has been recorded and will be available through the BPI website in the not too distant future where you can watch back and, and also share the links with, with colleagues, friends, students, anyone interested in the work that's being done around in, 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 in the region. We will be having, I think, a 30 minute break between the next session starting at 10.30 UK time, which will be on poverty and COVID-19 in Europe. Um, and in the afternoon from 1.30 UK time, there will be a session on poverty and COVID-19 in, and COVID in, in Africa with the final session beginning at 4 p.m. UK time, looking at COVID, uh, poverty and COVID in the Americas, uh, from North and South America. So please do join us with those. We will forgive those of you in East Asia who have probably gone to bed by that time, but thank you for attending and, 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 <laughs> and staying up um, thus far. Um, please do engage with online discussions via the BPI's Twitter slash X account, which is at Bristol Poverty and also with the conference hashtag. None of this means anything to me, I'm sorry. Hashtag BPI 2024. Um, I need to join the 21st century. I understand the BPI support team will share a closing slide at this point, if possible, um, with contact details of, of everything else. And um, thank you everyone, and hopefully see many of you in half an hour. Thank you everybody. Thank you.